So hello and welcome to the Weave Online User Group. If this is your first time here, thanks so much for coming. Today's session is Implementing Progressive Delivery with Your Team by my colleague, Lee Kapili, Developer Experience Engineer here at WeWorks. This is a regular program that we've been doing now for a couple of years here at WeWorks. My name is Stacy Potter and I'm a community manager uh, filling in for Tomo who is out sick today. We're still in the beginning of our 2020 spring season here. This is our third session of the year and we'll be hosting these about every two weeks um, at the same time, 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, every Tuesday, every other Tuesday. Uh, so it's our goal to bring you a variety of speakers for these sessions. And if you'd like, uh, if you feel like there's a better time or a better topic or any topic that you'd really like to hear about, don't hesitate to give us that feedback. Um, you'll receive a follow-up email after this webinar to share the slide and the recording. Um, but we'd, we'd also love to hear your thoughts uh, if you have any uh, regarding the, the recording or the um, future sessions. So we want to make these as interesting and relevant and meaningful for you as we can. So before I turn it over to Lee, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on who we are here at WeaveWorks. So thanks for listening. And if you've never heard of us before, we're a startup called WeaveWorks. We're headquartered in London with offices in San Francisco, Berlin, New York, Colorado, and as well as distributed teams all around the globe. If you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, our CEO and CTO are the ones who created the technology and the company around that and then sold it to VMware. And over time, they noticed some increasing needs in the container and Kubernetes space and started building some open source projects that then turned into products and led to our company WeaveWorks. We're VC funded. Amongst them is Excel Partners. We also like to mention Google Ventures because it is part of our long investment in the Kubernetes community. If you've heard of us before, some of these open source projects may be familiar to you. As I mentioned, we started with some open source projects. The earliest was WeaveNet, which continues to be one of the premier projects to network your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, others that have come along are Flux and Cortex, which are now in the CNCF. Flux you may know as uh, an automated deployment tool, which also led to our coining the term GitOps, which has really taken off in the last year or so. Uh, Cortex builds upon really, um, builds upon and really makes Prometheus scalable as well as other things. We have many more, but another one that I'll mention that you've heard of, which Lee will probably talk about today, is we Flagger, which extends the GitOps capabilities by bringing things like uh, canary deployments and blue-green to your Kubernetes usage by levering the, leveraging the most, um, in most cases, service meshes, but also in some other cases, uh, ways of bringing what is now increasingly being called progressive delivery, which is our topic today. One last project that I'll highlight is uh, EKS Cuddle, or EKS Control, whichever you prefer, which is now the official CLI for Amazon EKS. It was developed by our team here as an open source project to really help people get on board with different Kubernetes offerings out there. Like I said, there are many, many more, as you can see from this list. But if you're interested in uh, learning more, you can reach out to us or they're all up on uh, GitHub, so you can check them out there. And as a company, uh, we make products. <laughs> you can pay us for things. Uh, our first product is, our very first product was called uh, Weave Cloud. It's now been around for a couple of years. Um, it's a SaaS product that helps you monitor, manage, and do automated deployments for your Kubernetes clusters, uh, brings in GitOps, and in some ways you can think of it as hosted and supported versions of some of the open source projects that we have. Uh, we've been running Weave Cloud on Kubernetes uh, on AWS in production for the last four plus years now. And while we're selling Weave Cloud, while we were selling Weave Cloud, we found many people uh, who were actually really excited that we had this kind of experience and were asking for the platform or support. So now we offer for pay, you know, some levels of consulting, training, and support, but primarily to the now productized version of that uh, Kubernetes layer that we created, which is now called Weave Kubernetes Platform. So we do a lot of different GitOps things uh, in and around open source, but if you want to take that to the enterprise level, um, with teams and more controls than WKP is that product. So again, if you've never heard of us before, we're WeaveWorks. You can check us out online at weave.works. 
And lastly, a little bit of housekeeping. So we're lucky enough to have my colleague Lee from our DX team here today presenting. Uh, these sessions usually last about 30 to 45 minutes, but typically hover around the 45 minute mark. We do have a hard stop at 60 minutes. So if you have more questions, please reach out on Slack or uh, email and we'll be following up with an email as well. Um, so Zoom is our platform for today. Uh, if you can, please find, try and find the chat box, which it looks like most of you have. Um, it's down at the bottom on the toolbar. So click that. That's where we'll take all of our questions today. Uh, so if you can just change the to field uh, to all attendees and panelists, this will allow everyone in the audience to see the questions. Um, and, you know, a lot of the times we have our attendees who will actually answer questions for us. So um, we want to make sure that everybody can see your questions, unless it's something, you know, super private that you want to ask us offline, which is fine too. Um, if you're having trouble finding the chat button or the toolbar, you can hit escape to get out of full screen mode. Um, and then you should be able, that should make it easier for you to see that bar at the bottom. All right, so that is it for me. And with that, Lee, I will stop sharing and hand it over to you. Thanks, Stacy. Appreciate you uh, going over all of the open source projects that we have. I'm just going to share my desktop here. Um, hi, if I've never met you before, my name is Lee. I work with Weave here, uh, contribute to Kubernetes Upstream. And uh, I live here in Colorado. Uh, on the left here, you can see I like, I like to do a lot of parkour. Uh, this is a picture of my dog. He's a very good boy. And this is a picture of my spouse. So that's a little about me. And today we're talking about not just what progressive delivery is from a technical standpoint, but I want to get into a little bit of the social habits that are actually enabled when you adopt a mechanism that gives you progressive delivery, right? Because the tools, right, it's, it's just like a programming language, but what you do with it and who you work with and why you do something and the product or the service that you deliver to the people that actually make that service valuable, right, is the interesting part, right? And so the what is maybe not so much what we wanna focus on, but why and with who and how, right? So implement, implementing progressive delivery with your team, what does it take? Now, just as a little bit of a prereq, um, we've got some related material that you can look at. Uh, the first is actually about zero downtime app lifecycle. Uh, particularly on Kubernetes, I would say that this is a very different thing than progressive delivery. I would also consider it a prerequisite to having mature app lifecycle on Kubernetes uh, in production. So if you haven't learned or you haven't thought much about the specific things you need to do to keep your app serving traffic with no downtime as you continuously deploy it, then you're going to want to watch something like this talk or there are several great blog posts out there uh, that go that cover everything from like actually making sure your application can serve multiple versions at the same time uh, to the intricacies of the little things you need to add in your Kubernetes deployments and in your ingress implementation uh, to make sure that you're not dropping traffic or sending it someplace where the app is not ready or shutting down. So um, as far as instrumenting your actual, like say you're using microservices, uh, in which case your deployment topology is pretty complex, uh, but you can deploy in smaller units. You wanna be able to know what you are doing and metrics and these other um, interfaces that fall into observability, such as tracing, uh, just the ability to know what's happening, log collection, all of that. You want a platform capability deployed that's kind of probably maintained by somebody whose full-time job uh, is to make sure that these interfaces are up uh, to understand the behavior of what you are mutating in your systems. So, um, you might want to go take a look at the red method. Uh, this is just a basic framework if you don't know where to start uh, on the rates that you should be tracking, uh, the durations of things such as latency, uh, as well as the number of errors and the categories of those errors that are surfacing in your application. Uh, the bigger your application, so the, the more you're going towards monoliths rather than microservices, the more detailed uh, the metrics that you are exposing are going to need to be. 
And um, yeah, also a good note here is that many service meshes, so it's a huge benefit that is touted when you move to a service mesh is now you have this platform abstraction that's in between the way that your applications talk to each other. Uh, then expose metrics that are contextual about how these apps uh, communicate. And so you might get a little bit of benefit from the automatic exposing of red metrics. And so like say your, your um, service mesh exposes red via Prometheus, uh, then today we can also talk a little bit about how Flagger, uh, project, an open source project, and Stefan's actually uh, here in our audience, he's the maintainer and creator of Flagger. Um, it's a completely open source project that WeaveWorks runs that allows you to do progressive delivery on Kubernetes in a Kubernetes declarative native way. Uh, and it can integrate directly with these Prometheus red metrics that are exposed by service meshes such as Linkerd or App Mesh or some of these uh, load balancers such as Glue. Um, the last thing is if you wanna actually get your hands dirty, right? So today we're talking not just about technical stuff, but socio-technical problem solving, um, then go ahead and check out our self-paced hands-on lab. Uh, this costs about like $7 to run for like a day or two. And uh, yeah, it'll get you up with an EKS cluster, a service mesh, you'll have you doing GitOps, and you'll be doing progressive delivery with our pod info demo application uh, on uh, Kubernetes with Flagger. So, um, I've been mentioning Flagger a lot. Flagger is dope. Uh, what does Flagger let you do? So the high level Flagger capabilities, it's, I, if you're thinking in terms of progressive delivery, I like to think about feature gating. Um, and what is the purpose of the canary, right? So you've introduced something new, right? As a business, you're like, I want to know if I change a color, if I uh, deploy some new business logic and I want to see if it's faster, like I'm introducing something new, I'm mutating my system, right? And the purpose of the canary is to bring that into traffic simultaneously and start progressively moving customers or users who have opted in to do so to that canary deployment of your application. And Flagger allows you to describe, to, to make literally a descriptive policy, to put it into Kubernetes and to operate it for you when you mutate your deployment. So you can describe durations for which these policies should be in effect when a change occurs. You can describe metrics thresholds for which that over that duration, um, what you expect the canary to perform towards, right? And so if you wanna make sure that it's like within an acceptable latency for the next 45 minutes, right? Then that's something that you can describe in a flagger canary object. And then um, uh, you can describe weighted routing. Uh, this is a good technique for infrequently hit routes that are in your business logic. Um, it can also compose well with feature persistence uh, from like an upstream load balancer that's providing some sticky sessions. Uh, I don't really like this technique actually. I prefer header matching. Uh, which is something that you can do in Flagger as well, uh, introspecting the HTTP request uh, and having some smarts on the client side to indicate uh, that you would like to be in a particular feature group. Uh, and then you, you can also hook in things with pre-rollout and rollout hooks uh, to implement your custom logic for either blocking or mutating the behavior of your Canary deployment. So you can do things like load testing or acceptance testing or even uh, long polling on a manual feature gate inside of Jenkins or something. Really rad. Um, let's go ahead and just take a quick look at the Flagger API so this is not just like super abstract. Uh, I've just pulled up an example from our awesome documentation here. Uh, if you've ever looked at Kubernetes from a technical standpoint, you're probably uh, familiar with this Kubernetes API style. And so here you can see that we've got the Flagger API. This is a kind canary uh, for our application, the pod info. And uh, here we have a spec where we target a deployment. And then you can also target the horizontal pod autoscaler for that deployment. So this is how you can get some elasticity. What I really like about Flagger canaries is that they don't introduce a new construct into Kubernetes. In fact, you can implement Flagger directly on top of existing deployments and existing horizontal pod autoscalers 
and on top of an existing mesh or ingress or even native Kubernetes service solution inside of your cluster. And so um, it composes very well and in an incredibly native manner using some clever tricks with this uh, HPA. And uh, basically what happens is once you uh, create this canary and you target the deployment in HPA, then Flagger will actually create a copy for you and start mutating them in accordance with the policy that you've created. And it'll configure the mesh or, or whatever your traffic provider is to route traffic in the proper way. Uh, the other thing that's awesome about this is like, say you're using Istio, which like, you know, might require a lot of very deep knowledge of you know, virtual nodes, virtual services, all of these like crazy constructs that you need to put together. Um, you can actually represent a great 80% use case with just the canary object, and it will go ahead and create all of that stuff on your behalf. So um, makes it very simple to actually get started uh, with an ingress or service mesh uh, doing progressive delivery as opposed to getting into all of the particulars of your implementation keeps it a little more agnostic. But then, okay, well, we've targeted our native Kubernetes objects. We talked a little bit about how it does it, but where's the good stuff, right? Where's the actual policy that I want to implement and what can that let me do, right? This is a great example here. Um, here, there is a pre rollout webhook, right? So, what this means is that, like, before Flagger actually does the canary, it's going to call out and do uh, this blocking webhook right here and it'll actually do it, run an acceptance test. And then similarly, uh, there's a rollout hook here that says, hey, while I'm starting my Canary deployment and starting to send a little bit of traffic to it, I'm inside the rollout. Could you please also make sure that not only do we have, you know, whatever customer traffic is there, but that we also have a non-trivial amount of synthetic traffic and so here we see that we're invoking the hey command line tool through the flagger load test webhook. Uh, which is a service that you can deploy into your namespace uh, next to your application. And uh, we're actually running a load test, right? So like this is a description of a policy that actually creates a load test every time I'm running a Canary deployment and I didn't have to write any scripts or do any CI. And this is what I really like about Flagger. Technically, uh, from a tooling standpoint, it's amazing. This is, it's descriptive. It's declarative and it's flexible. You can see all of the other stuff in here, the interval for which your Canary deployment is expected to succeed, how quickly it should progress, um, the metrics thresholds that you expect to stay within um, appropriate bounds. And if any of this stuff actually falls out of policy uh, and starts violating what you're expecting from a declarative standpoint during your Canary deployment, then the Canary gets yanked, right? And so that's the safety portion of this technical capability. Now you're empowering your teams to deploy with more uh, really ornate and specific declarations. These policies allow you to create very incredible behaviors that are you know, extensible and done in a Kubernetes way. You can bolt this stuff onto your existing things and like, you get safety out of it. So I'm, I'm just, I get very excited about this, but less about Flagger, right? So this is an incredible tool set, but what does that actually enable to, to do, right? So you've got Red, right? You configured your application to be zero downtime because it's just a good prerequisite of, of actually using Kubernetes in a production ready way. So you've got your metrics, you have your dashboards, and now you're, you have this canary mechanism and you're starting to control the policy by which applications roll out. And so now you've hit the people interface, right? Your developers are, you know, um, they're deploying changes, you know, 50 times a day. <laughs> let's just, let's get very optimistic on like six services and the change review is starting to get a little bit tough. You know, there's like, you're releasing some faults into production. There are defects. Uh, customers are reporting bugs. Your, you know, um, your support team is starting to have a little bit of load, and your engineering manager is like working with the product owner, and they're like, "Oh wow, like this is getting a little bit intense." Hopefully, I, I don't know if this is ringing a bell to anybody, or maybe this is your company, like right now. I've certainly 
experienced this environment before uh, where we got really successful at pushing a lot of change and then stuff started blowing up and we realized that we weren't actually being very intentional about our decisions. Um, and so, you know, some examples might be like, hey, maybe engineering and product should review some clear metrics together about what you're trying to change in this sprint, right? Or for the next release. Maybe there should be a communication to a stakeholder and maybe they should be the one to actually click the button to approve the canary. And how could you do that? Maybe in a pre rollout hook, right? So say that engineering, like, you know, like got all of the software built in CI and then they worked with their platform person, you know, to get it deployed. And now the canary is in, in the pre rollout state, but it's hooked and it's waiting on something, right? Waiting for that manual approval of a business stakeholder. Maybe you want to hold a team review of like some co like key release risks and struggles before you decide to move forward with something, right? And so this decision making component is a very key part of doing software properly and doing progressive delivery, which is a very high order function of software development lifecycle. And um, and then you might also be like working with the new SRE team that you just made and tried to hire a bunch of people for. And uh, you found some people, you know, who had a resume where they're like, I want to be an SRE. But then this discipline is super new and you're like trying to read the SRE book because there's like two of those now. And you're like, what is this even? How do I even do that? What does it even mean? And I would ask you again, why? Right? Why do you want to do SRE? Site reliability engineering or customer reliability engineering, product engineering, um, like what is the purpose of that and where it composes with progressive delivery is I see this as a mechanism that when met with other prerequisite platform capabilities allows you to sample your traffic and measure your mutations. And by the way, since metrics is such an important part of that, I would say that you should probably have a little bit of metrics retention. You need to at least have enough retention for the period of your delivery and then also the period of review, right? So if an incident occurs and you're like, hey, we released five changes, which one's the defect? You need to be able to know in the past three days which one of those um, actually had an effect. And sometimes with distributed systems, those effects can be a little bit nuanced, right? Um, so you'll want to solve that metrics retention problem. Uh, and also things like logs uh, and traces if you are even uh, getting to the maturity level of tracing uh, at a scale. So um, sometimes like people get hung up on these acronyms uh, and they start throwing them around and it's not, I don't think common knowledge. I haven't ex you know, empirically experienced that a lot of people know what these things are, uh, but they are becoming industry standard terms. Uh, the first thing is it's all about service levels, right? And so in relation to a metric, this could either be quantitative or qualitative. Um, and the indicator or SLI is typically the thing you're talking about. So this will be the quantifiable bit uh, that you can automate upon. Now, once you have the indicator, you can create objectives around those things. And SLOs are often internal, right? You can talk about these things in meetings. You can say, hey, like we're holding an, a team SLO. Uh, we'd like to be able to stay, you know, uh, over 99 point, you know, five, seven percent request success rate or something like that. And uh, in deployment periods, you know, we'd like our mean time to recovery to be, you know, X and X minutes. And then once, you know, you've kind of got the prerequisites to be working with indications and objectives, right? So you're actually able to monitor your metrics, you've got habits, and you can make hypotheses and actually monitor what you are mutating. It's at that point where you've reached a maturity where you can be creating agreements based off of these formal terms, right? So now you actually have measurements, the real stats, they actually mean something. It's not just like Pingdom sending your manager an email saying your service was up 99.97% of the time, right? Like, what does that mean, right? So you've built a good culture around actually evaluating these things you can make meaningful agreements between parties. Some examples might be, you know, between a service provider and a consumer, like your business and some users, you know, 
And that could be internal, it could be external, it could be between teams, it could be between the platform and development teams. Uh, in your SLA, you could implement something called an error budget, right, which is uh, an agreement about the indicator of the number of errors for a particular service. Uh, and, you know, when your error budget runs out, say you've incurred too many errors in a time period, such as a sprint or several months, you know, you might not have any error budget for more feature development until you improve the stability of your deploys releases or the platform itself. You know, and these things are enforceable. They're contracts that are often formal and either culturally uh, from a management or team perspective or even legally binding uh, between businesses. So um, that's a bunch of jargon stuff. And this is ultimately a framework for maturity that allows you to evaluate uh, how you are mutating and measuring things. So coming back to progressive delivery, ultimately you've reached a maturity where you're not breaking stuff all the time when you deploy to Kubernetes. Uh, you have got red metrics or some metrics evaluation strategy, some framework for understanding what your services actually do when you change them. You have a mechanism such as Flagger that allows you to actually implement a feature gating strategy, allows you to hook on policies and, and you know, do your business logic. And you've got a decision making approach. And then when getting into SRE, red with the metrics retention and whatever else you're doing around that enables you to monitor your SLIs, set your SLOs and keep your SLAs, your agreements with people. And this composes well with progressive delivery mechanism, mechanisms. So um, I, I hope that this has been a, a good introduction or at least a, like a, a pushing kind of set of material that's allowing you to think about how you can be successful in your own teams, in your own business, ultimately shaping traffic intentionally so that you can deliver more features, be more stable, you know, and push your business forward, build something great and build it safely and with sustainable software engineering practices. So, uh, I would love to hear if you're doing SRE, if you're doing progressive delivery, if you're playing with these things, uh, there are other uh, capabilities that are in a related mechanism, such as load shedding uh, and traffic shifting, uh, like moving traffic around, you know, based on uh, waves of users and that kind of thing. Uh, very interesting stuff, auto scaling, all that. So I, I really uh, do wish this to be useful for you and would love to hear uh, more stories. Thanks. Hit me up. Thanks, Lee. Um, so I don't know if you saw the chat, but maybe you want to check it out. There's been some, some discussion about WeaveNet, working with Linkerd and just things like that. So um, I know that, uh, that Kingdon and, and um, Sebastian jumped in with, with a couple of thoughts here on the chat, but maybe you want to talk about this too. Mm -hmm. So um, Sam had asked, you know, does WeaveNet compete with, with Linkerd as a mm -hmm. mesh? And maybe you could just talk a little bit about, you know, WeaveNet and the differences there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would not say that WeaveNet and Linkerd uh, or Istio and those kinds of things are really uh, in the same category of the capabilities they are looking to provide your business. Uh, one thing that I think is very special about WeaveNet is that it allows you to flatten network topologies uh, and so you can create cross-cloud meshes uh, with a single IP space. And WeaveNet does have a lot of service mesh type features, um, such as measuring how much traffic is going around, knowing the identities of services, uh, enforcing network policies. And then also um, there are much less well-known features of WeaveNet, such as a service discovery and mesh provided DNS. Uh, but then when you get into, I'd, I'd say WeaveNet's like very layer four, you know, it's, it's at that, TCP IP and then kind of decorating it with what the platform knows about the identity of services uh, and the volume of, in which they are using the network resource. Uh, so when you get to Linkerd and Istio, um, these meshes provide layer four capabilities in some respect. There's a little bit of bleed through, but you still need something underneath. Uh, and I think that 
psyllium is a solution that's kind of crossing that line. It's both layer seven and layer four. But then in, in the linker D and Istio space, right now you can do things like header matching. You can do um, sh uh, circuit breakers, right? So when your service starts breaking, you can send traffic somewhere else. You can like have uh, retries and all of these things, uh, gRPC related stuff, uh, MongoDB related stuff, um, Kafka, uh, Cilium has like a bunch of Kafka related features. So very interesting, like as you get more into the workload that's necessary to provide your service or run your business. Um, these meshes uh, have additional overhead and infrastructure, but provide you protocol specific capabilities. Uh, hopefully that's a pretty clear answer. And as a follow on to that, I think um, Sam had also asked, you know, uh, would you tend to not want two meshes running? Um, yeah, I, I see somebody, uh, Seb Sebastian, uh, he works with us, mentioned that Linkerd and WeaveNet are at different layers. Right. Uh, so there is a good divide there. Um, it would get more confusing if you were using like Linkerd maybe plus Cilium uh, because then you can implement policy uh, at a few different layers. Uh, but it's still you know, something I think that would be useful. Like, I don't think you couldn't use Linkerd usefully on Cilium, uh, even though Cilium provides a lot of these top level abstractions directly through some very cool kernel features. Um, you can still get the benefits of something like Istio or Linkerd on top of it. Um, because ultimately that base level network function that's provided by Flannel or Weave or Calico or Cilium or uh, KubeNet or whatever, uh, Kube Router, these CNI providers, they may have a little bit of overlap. They may provide additional introspection. So for instance, uh, WeaveNet uh, composes very well with scope, right? Uh, you can see at a, at a cluster level, at the very base network level, how things are behaving and you get some benefits if you use Weave scope on top of WeaveNet. Right? Uh, then you could still use Linkerd on top of that and use the Linkerd dashboard you know, to get additional observability and whether or not you want to run those things, incur that infrastructure overhead and whether or not you can build team habits around the tool uh, because that's the important part, right? The tool is not important. It's what you do with it. It's how you work with it. It's how it enables collaboration. Uh, then that's where, you know, you have to assess the value of what you're doing. So. Cool. Well, if you have any other questions, please, uh, Type them in. Uh, looks like we just had one come in. Does it show, does scope uh, show or illustrate the progress swap over? The best place to see uh, something like what is happening at a basic level, you can do a kubectl describe canary uh, and you can build things around that. Uh, the state machine of what is occurring with your canary is described there, also in the flagger logs. Uh, but then if you want a user uh, interface, then you that's usually provided by the mesh. Uh, so Istio has, I forget, something that starts with a K and then Linkerd has their dashboard. Um, and the reason why uh, I don't say that scope is really like in that same category uh, is it just doesn't have all of the other things that are decorating it. Uh, if you were looking at the two deployments for your canary, right, the primary one that's receiving your customer traffic and the canary deployment that's been copied uh, and or rather copied from in flagger uh, in scope then you would just see the traffic shifting in terms of a volume standpoint uh, which would it would still be useful then, um, thanks so much for the questions by the way they're great questions and i appreciate the compliment as well it's very <laughs> humbling awesome so um, yeah, if that's it and we don't have any more questions, I'll just close it out. So uh, as a reminder, um, I mentioned in the opening, we'll have uh, these Weave Online user groups every other Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. So join us back here in a couple weeks. Next week's uh, talk is about our uh, semi-new uh, project, WKS Control or WKS Cuddle, whichever you prefer, uh, which is our uh, GitOps management of Kubernetes clusters. So our teammate Jerry is going to be presenting that and uh, should be super interesting. So check that out next week. 
Um, you'll get an email follow up to this whiskey control. That's right, Kingdon. <laughs> um, so you, we'll, we'll send you a follow up email uh, with some links uh, and be sure to check out our Slack channel. If you have any questions, you can hit us up there or hit Lee up there. Um, and be sure to check out and join the Weave user group uh, meetup page. That's our single source of truth for all of these sessions. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. And thank you, Lee, for that session. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll catch you next time. Yeah. Thank you guys all. So okay. see everyone later. Bye.